This is going to be titled, Everybody is Wrong on Something. For all the people who think that they're right on everything or that their teacher is right on everything, you're wrong on that. Uh, the first thing is, no man is ever 100% truthful through his entire life. Romans 3, 4 says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So every man is going to have something he says in his preaching or teaching that's just flat out not true. Whether it be because he's trying to save face, or not to offend somebody, or to stay in a certain clique, or he just is flat out uh, ignorant on the, on the issue or made a mental mistake, or something. Remember, when a man gets born again, his flesh doesn't get born again. He can be in danger of deception, just like anyone else. That's why Paul constantly says, be not deceived. He can be in danger of being uh, tempted to do, say things to keep money or to make money. You know, there's many things that can happen. But one thing's for certain is everybody's wrong on something. Everybody's gonna not going to be 100% truthful. Nobody will be 100% truthful 100% of the time. So remember, no man is perfect. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes 7.20, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Let's examine some men in the Bible. For example, Peter. Peter has his ups and downs. There were times when he was spot on. For example, in Matthew 16, 13 through 16, it says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So then there were times when he needed to be rebuked. Here he said the right thing. He was spot on. And then you see times when he had to be rebuked because he was never 100% right 100% of the time. In uh, Matthew 16, 21 through 23. This is even in the same chapter. From that time forth began Jesus... <clears throat> to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, thus sh shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So Peter preached at Pentecost and had 3,000 saved. And he's the one that said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He spoke up out of everybody and said that. But then he's also the one that Jesus looked at and said, Get thee, be get thee behind me, Satan. So Jesus, or Peter's not above rebuke. Because he's not 100% right 100% of the time. He's right most of the time, but he's also wrong sometimes. And that's true for any person. Peter preached at Pentecost, and he had 3,000 saved. Then you read in Galatians, where he's rebuked again. In Galatians 2, 11 through 13, it says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, this is Paul talking, he, Paul says, I was stood into the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So he was so wrong here that he affected other people with what he was wrong with. Even after being rebuked, he called Paul a beloved brother. Paul rebuked him, but still, if you read in Peter's epistles, he calls Paul a beloved brother. Unlike most people today, he would make a retaliation video to straighten out their brother in return. 2 Peter 3.15 says, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. 
even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you. So Peter calls Paul a beloved brother after he's rebuked by Paul. But that's just one man there. Peter was wrong on some things. And then you have Apollos. Look at Apollos here in Acts 18, 24 through 26. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. So he's eloquent and he's mighty in the scriptures. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded him the way of God more perfectly. So you see, he was an eloquent man. He was mighty in the scriptures, a man instructed in the way of the Lord, fervent in the spirit, spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, spoke boldly. But yet Aquila and Priscilla had to take him to the side and tell him, some things about Jesus Christ. He only knew the baptism of John. So you see, Apollos humbled himself and listened to what he was told by Aquila and Priscilla, and it made him better. A wise man will hear and increase learning. You know, he, he wasn't 100% right because everybody is wrong on something, even men like Peter and Apollos. Hopefully that... You've probably got a lot of good traits, but hopefully when someone comes to you and shows you something from the scriptures that you're wrong about, hopefully you can tell that person that they're right and you showed me from the Bible. And then you change your beliefs to fit the Bible and not say, well, I've always believed this way. And say, well, I'm believing this because this is my tradition and I've always believed this way and my granddaddy believed this way. Hopefully you can change your beliefs to fit the Bible just like Apollos changed his beliefs. And then next you have this guy named Mark. In Acts 15, 37 through 40, it says, And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with him, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with him to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed to sunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So Paul and Mark had something that caused them to be at division. But in Second Timothy four eleven it says only Paul says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So so uh, you see that Mark, he's a good man. He's a godly man. But there was something that separated him and Paul. Mark wasn't 100% right all the time. Paul was a, wasn't 100% right. Everybody is wrong on something. But yet, they come back together. Paul says he's profitable to me for the ministry. So there are hopefully that when you have a disagreement with somebody, you can still come back together and be and be friends again and not be divided over something minor now, if it's something major you'll have to break fellowship but mostly the things that people fight about are pretty minor but having given you some examples of men who were wrong in the scriptures let's talk about how to handle men who are wrong today first sit back and think for a minute you are flesh just like the man you believe is wrong he's also flesh you're bound to be wrong on something I know for a fact that somewhere in what I teach, I'm bound to be wrong on something. That is why your confidence should be in God and not in man. It should be in Scripture and not in man's books and sermons and notes and study Bibles. Even though I use all those things and they're, they're a great help, your confidence should be in the Bible itself. Psalms 118.8 says it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. So if you realize that you're just as much flesh as the next guy, then why do you constantly spend your time beating each other up? Many times a man starts preaching, he becomes popular, he creates a movement. Maybe he was critical of everyone else around him in his preaching, always calling other Christians names like heretic and false prophet and bozo. 
and pointing out flaws in another preacher's outward appearance to make fun of that person. His movement was based on being critical and bad-mouthing everyone who doesn't agree with him. So then when he starts to send out other preachers who sit under his ministry, after a while, they begin to get a mind of their own to a certain extent because, you know, they've been out from under him. They've been studying on their own a little bit. And then when he comes out with a sermon or does something that his little protégés don't agree with, they will turn on him and to begin to be critical of him and badmouth him. Do you know why? Because that's how they were trained. He trained them that way. He went around criticizing everybody, bashing everybody, calling everybody a heretic and a false prophet and a bozo, making fun of their physical appearance, making fun of their personality. And that's how he trained his men. So when they got out on their own, they started doing the same thing to him. Uh, many men train other men to be critical and train them to be mean to the point that they can't have a normal fellowship life with any Christian because they're going to criticize everything and everybody. They can't go to another church and sit down to enjoy the service because the whole time they're going to try and try to find some way that the pastor is a compromiser or is ecumenical or find some way he's wrong on prophecy or in other parts of his doctrine. But Paul does make it clear that there are men to avoid. There are men to separate from and even names some men by name at times. But for the most part, in the Bible-believing world, you can fellowship with people. But there's just no good reason to separate from other Christians who live separated lives, they preach the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, and they're King James Bible believers. If they're wrong on prophecy or have some extreme views on s certain things, Many times you can look over that stuff if you if they have the testimony that they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone for salvation, then that's what matters because we're all members of the same body. And we need each member of the body, as it talks about in 1 Corinthians 12, not just the ones who agree with us 100%. Now, on the other hand, I'm not saying to go join up with the Pentecostals and the Church of Christ and the Catholics and be ecumenical. I'm saying if you're a born-again believer, as a King James Bible believer, and there's other King James Bible believers who preach the right gospel, then they're on your team. 2 Timothy 4.2 says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So a man should preach and teach doctrine. Doctrine divides by itself. You don't have to add any extra oomph to make people mad. Doctrine divides by itself. You don't have to add in some little smart aleck remarks to divide even more. Preach and teach the right doctrine and the right people will come to you. You can contrast truth with error. The heresies just reveal the truth better when they are laid side by side. It says in 1 Corinthians 11, 19, For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So when I teach doctrine and expose error, if it is the error of a brother in Christ, I don't do it at the expense of their ministry. I rarely say anything personal about another teacher. I don't try to put a nail in the coffin on their ministry. I don't judge them by their children. If their children mess up, I don't say, well, you should just throw out their ministry. That would be foolish. Pretty much what I'm trying to say is people really need to take it easy. In Romans 12, 18, it says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Don't have one of the ministries where you spend all your time writing books against so-and-so. Because some men are just against everybody except themselves. The world loves to look at Christians who go at each other's throats. Galatians 5.15 5, 5, 5, says, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Many Christians are just going around bad-mouthing each other, and it's a mockery. It's pathetic. But this has just been a quick video to make you realize Everybody is wrong on something. You're not 100% right. I'm not 100% right. Your favorite teacher is not 100% right. People are still flesh. We don't have a glorified body yet. We're going to mess up. And if it's not just some huge damnable error, 
then you should have grace with people just like Jesus Christ had grace with you.